Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 12, 1969, Led Zeppelin played at the San Francisco Fillmore West as part of the first tour for the band in the United States. It also happened to be the first date that Led Zeppelin won record released in the U.S. by Atlantic Records. A release that has widely been considered extremely significant in the progression of hard rock and heavy metal for years to come. On this same day, albeit about 3,000 miles southeast, a significant event for the NFL occurred. It's something you know about. In fact, I guarantee it. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time when we step up the DeLorean, the date is January 12th, 1969. And we took a plane. We're no longer in San Francisco because we're outside the parking lot of the Orange Bowl in Miami, Florida. Maybe we just crossed the street after picking up our copy of Led Zeppelin 1. We tossed that sucker into our 8-track player for a little pregame action. And we're going to get ready for this big game that we have coming up. What game, you ask? Huh. Well, I referenced to it in the intro. It's often referred to as the guarantee game. We're here to watch... Super Bowl three. I mean, we all know the outcome. The Jets surprisingly and stunningly beat the Baltimore Colts 16 to seven in what is widely considered the greatest upset in Super Bowl history. And again, most of you know about that guarantee and why it's called often as the Joe Namath Super Bowl. I mean, sure, that's true. Broadway Joe was the quarterback of the winning team, the New York Jets. And he also was selected as the game's MVP. But it wasn't all Joe Namath in that season, or that game, just like it never is for any Super Bowl winning team. It took every player, every coach, administrative staff member, and everyone else involved in the organization to just get the team to the Super Bowl, let alone be the first AFL team to win the big game. And that's why I bring this week's guest on the show to ride shotgun with us in the DeLorean. His name is Bob Letterer. And he authored a book to celebrate the entire team of the 1968 New York Jets. The book is titled Beyond Broadway Joe, the Super Bowl team that changed football. You can pick this book up at your favorite bookstore. And if you plan on going through Amazon, well, there's a link in the show notes on the podcast player or to the web posts on the site, which is Sports History Network, the headquarters for sports yesteryear. And also, I want to give a special thanks to Bob here because he's going to offer a signed copy of the book to one lucky winner. Now, to get yourself signed up for this giveaway, all you have to do is go to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. Now, before we get into the interview, I got to remind you of something I haven't done in a while. You got to mash that little subscribe or follow button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest off the press episodes every other week. But without further ado, here's that interview I'm talking about with Bob Letterer covering his book, Beyond Broadway Joe. Right. And that's why I want to, there you go. Let's just get off with it. The title of the book right here is Beyond Broadway Joe, the Super Bowl team that changed football. And on Amazon.com, if we go right now, team is capitalized. So I wanted to 
start right there. Why is the word team emphasized? Because I told the publisher that's what I wanted. (laughs) And why did I want that? Because the book is really about, as I described it, the other 44 team members of the Jets in 1969 who didn't have Namath on the back of their uniform, as well as the ownership, the general manager, the -the behind-the-scenes people, including uh, the assistant coaches and uh, the pro personnel director and such, because they played a huge part um, in making the Jets' victory in Super Bowl III possible. And I look at Super Bowl III as the 44 other guys who lifted Namath up and allowed him to be this, you know, the the difference maker in the game um, and for the Jets to win. If you, you can go back and you can watch the game on the internet uh, from start to finish, including all the commercials. And at the end of the game, and this is what I loved and worked perfectly with my my idea about the uh, uh, the book, um, Aldi Regattas, who was doing color with Kurt Gowdy that day on NBC, just credited the offensive line for their protection for Joe the entire day. It was spot on. But on top of that, they did tremendous blocking for the Jets running backs, uh, Matt Snell, who set a an, an Super Bowl record that day of 121 yards, and the blocking and running that uh, Emerson Boozer and Bill Mathis did on top of that, uh, and the defense, which was rated the number one defense in the American Football League that year, uh, did an outstanding job, forced four turnovers. So, again, the idea behind – emphasizing and capitalizing team is that it was more than just a one-man effort. And I think one of the unfortunate things, uh, even in 2022, is that to the casual or average fan, when you mentioned the Jets winning Super Bowl three, they said, oh, that was the Joe Namath game. And yes, it was. But as I said before, it's because the other players really put Joe in a position uh, where he has been a national celebrity for 53 years since that game. Yeah, and that kind of alludes to we're we're, ta- we're one day after the Rams go moving, advancing to the Super Bowl. And as a Lions fan, you alluded, the, l- the listener of the show knows I'm going to talk about Matthew Stafford just a little bit. But the thing is, even though, yes, he's going to go and they're talking about Joe Cool as in the other no uh joe oh my gosh i can't think of the guy's last name right now for the Bengals, but burrow thank you so joe burrow and stafford is what is going to be talked about at nauseum of course the head coaches but what about all those other 52 men on the roster that active roster during the time and all the practice squad guys and, and arnie i've made the point to a lot of people that a book such as mine could be done about any super bowl winner because it's always the guys in the trenches and the guys who are unheralded and, and just don't get any attention at all um, that are the difference makers. And, you know, the, to me, again, the unfortunate thing about the Jets um, 53 years after winning that game is that they had 11 players on the team that year who the week after the Super Bowl started – in the American Football League All-Star game a year, a week later. 11 guys besides Namath. Hmm. And that shows you how talented across the board that team really was. And again, you, you could, it, it, it's really taking that to, to an extreme, but you could say the same thing now as you look at a Cincinnati, Los Angeles um, Super Bowl. I mean, those guys have to block for Burrow or he gets buried. Um, same thing for, you know, Stafford Stafford played with a very mediocre Detroit team for all those years and got traded, and, and, and the Rams went for it this year, and Stafford is being allowed to show everything he's got, and he's got a lot to show. But it's the guys around him that are making that, you know, very apparent. Yeah, that kind of leads into a question as far as the level of all-stars on the AFL Roster, but I want to go back to it. You said that you can watch the Super Bowl three in its entirety, including the commercials. What's one commercial that stands out in your mind that maybe I've never heard of? Well, there's a lot of cigarette commercials, which were <laughs> a 
there's a bunch of uh, – they're all interesting because um, it takes you back to that time. There's a lot of car commercials, and you can see what they were emphasizing. Those are the two that quickly jumped to mind to me. Yeah, that would be sim- – so like you said, with cigarette commercials being illegalized, and it's just – I guess one reason why I want to ask that question was the stark contrast sometimes of eras, and we even get into that later in this interview probably with like even the era of football a little bit. But let's go back to that. You said 11 players besides Namath on the all-star squad for the AFL from the Jets. Now, that was a team going into the Super Bowl. Obviously, it was considered the underdog, and that's why the guarantee made so much you know, headway and such. But after Super Bowl II, the conclusion. So at that time, many people thought the AFL could not even compete with the NFL. So this all-star roster... I'm using air quotes again, all of the best of the best almost of just the AFL was still considered inferior. What did that do? Let's lead into like what that game did for the Super Bowl, for the AFL NFL rivalry, all, all that type of stuff. I mean, let's just start right there. Super Bowl three and the impact. After, after the game, because the impact was enormous. Um, and I can tick them off, you know, in, in two or three different ways. Number one, because the Jets were uh, 17 and a half to 21 point underdogs. When I was 16 years old and as big a Jet fan as you could find, I didn't think they were going to win. I hoped that they wouldn't get embarrassed because that is what happened to Kansas City and Oakland playing against Green Bay in the Super Bowls in January 67 and January 68. But after the game, the AFL owners, who apparently didn't expect the Jets to win necessarily either, um, changed their whole attitude about the merger. Uh, in fact, I came across a magazine cover the other day, uh, and I've got it here and I'm going to find it. But basically it talked about the new look of um, uh, the, the National Football League after the merger. And this magazine came out before the Super Bowl. And it talks about um, – a, an American Football League East and West and a National Football League, and it came up with like ri- ridiculous names, nothing like East and West. Um, uh, and I, you know, I pulled this out the other day and, and I don't have it right here. But anyway, the AFL owners um, were just delirious about becoming part of the National Football League because it gave them an elevation, a credibility that they've been, you know, really desiring in the, in the worst possible way. Now, the Jets didn't have that problem because they played in New York and they were already selling out their games. And the Oakland Raiders were in a same, similar situation. And Kansas City was like that too. But if you look at Boston, they didn't even have a field to play on. They played in Fenway Park some games. They played in the old Braves field other games. Some games they played in Harvard. None of them sold out. Buffalo, which had won a couple of AFL championships in a row, um, had decent crowds, but when the team soured in the late 60s, they stopped drawing you know, quite a bit as well. Denver was drawing good crowds, but the owners didn't know what to make of it. And Denver in particular was just licking their chops about having Minnesota and Green Bay and the, the Dallas Cowboys come into Denver and sell out the stadium for them. Um, and that was pretty well, you know, felt across the American Football League. But after uh, the Super Bowl victory, the AFL owners, um, the, w- the way I think I described it in the book, their spine stiffened. And they said to the NFL, which had actually proposed absorbing all the AFL teams into a new National Football League. And what that would have amounted to was the Jets and the Giants division and Oakland in the 49ers division and the Houston Oilers in the Dallas Cowboys division, et cetera. Um, the owners decided, uh, we in, in the a- AFL, we want to maintain our identity. We want to keep our 10 franchises together. And... There were 10 AFL franchises. There were 16 NFL franchises. So Al Davis, ironically, came up with the idea 
let's move three teams from the NFL into the AFL. So we'll have 13 teams in each league. And the question then became, how do we get the three teams from the NFL to want to go to the supposedly inferior AFL, even though the AFL had just won the Super Bowl? And the answer was, give them $3 million as an inducement. And the first team that agreed to go over were the Cleveland Browns. And it was a great irony to that, because the Cleveland Browns had come into the NFL from the old All-American Football Conference in 1950. They had been the champions of the AAFC from 46 through 49. They won every year. And they had been one of the first teams to really bring in a lot of African-American players. And it made a huge difference to them. So in 1950, they went into the NFL. And the NFL owners said, oh, well, we're going to teach them a lesson. And they scheduled the first game of the 1950 season between the NFL champion Philadelphia Eagles and the Cleveland Browns of the old AAFC. Cleveland killed the Eagles. (laughs) And in the next five years, Cleveland went to the NFL championship game five years in a row. And they won, I think, two, at least two, maybe it was three times. So Cleveland was the first team to agree to go to the AFL. That was perfect because Paul Brown, who had bought the, the, the rights to the Cincinnati Bengals franchise, had gone into the AFL with the expressed understanding that someday – He wanted to be in a division with the Cleveland Browns. He wanted to get uh, even with the Cleveland Browns owner, Art Modell, who had pushed Paul Brown out in the early 60s. Paul Brown had obviously been one of the inventors of the whole Cleveland Browns franchise, and suddenly he was on the outside looking in. So he wanted the Cleveland Browns in his division. And so Cleveland going into the AFL made sense. Now, where did the other two guys, the other two teams come from? The Cleveland Browns' natural rival in the AFL were the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so Art Rooney, the Pittsburgh owner, said, well, for $3 million and the chance to be in a division with the Cleveland Browns and to play them twice a year, as we always have, um, I'll do that. I'll make the jump. So two out of three. And where's the third one? The Baltimore Colts. The owner of the Baltimore Colts, Carol Rosenblum, said to himself, let's see, I'm in the NFL, and I'm in the NFL Western Division. And he was. He, the Baltimore Colts were in a division with the Atlanta Falcons, uh, a fledgling you know, franchise just that started up, the San Francisco 49ers and the L.A. Rams. And the Baltimore fans love that. They love the competition. But Rosenblum said, wait a minute, if I go to the AFL, I'll be in a division with the Jets. And I'll have Namath coming in to Baltimore every single year. And wow, imagine the crowds I'm going to get from doing that. So he became the third team that the Baltimore Colts did. Ironically, that actually led to the Baltimore Colts and Rosenblum being sold uh, about three or four years later because the Colts fans re- revolted. They wanted to see the Rams. They wanted to see the 49ers every year. They didn't really care about you know, the Buffalo Bills and Boston Patriots and Miami Dolphins, who they were going to have coming in regularly to visit them. So that was one of the big changes that happened. Another change that happened is the NFL for about five years have been trying to interest any of the TV networks, ABC, NBC, or CBS at that time, to do Monday Night Football. And nobody wanted to do Monday Night Football. In fact, the famous story that the uh, the NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle, went to the president of CBS, Bill Paley, and said to him, we'd like you to do Monday Night Football. And Bill Paley said, let me get this straight. You want me to get rid of Lucille Ball on Monday night, who was the biggest star in television in those days, and replace it with a football game? Now, football was a very popular sport. But not like it is today. So CBS was out. NBC wasn't interested. And ABC, which was the third network and didn't have any uh, professional football at all, said, we'll take it. So finally, the NFL landed a Monday night football contract. And we all know now 
how popular uh, that was. I think it's not as popular today as it was maybe 20 years ago, but it became the must-see TV uh, for, for many, many years. Um, one of the other interesting things that happened was the PR director for the Buffalo Bills somehow convinced the NFL to include all AFL records and put them in the NFL record book. Uh, and that was quite quite a, a thing to happen because suddenly it gave credibility to, most people would admit, to admittedly really inferior AFL football teams from the early 60s who had set all kinds of records. Classic point. Um, the Buffalo Bills in the, uh, the time of like 64 through 66 gave up one rushing touchdown in about almost 30 games. And that's still an NFL record. Again, again, against some pretty inferior competition, but but that was the case. So those are some of the prime examples. Um, but we would not have the conference, the conferences that we recognize today and the teams that we recognize today without Super Bowl three, because otherwise all those teams in the AFL would have been absorbed into the NFL and it would have just been one, you know, giant national football league instead of two different conferences. And and the other idea, the reason why that, that also was important is that the NFL had actually announced, Commissioner Rosell had announced two days before Super Bowl three that they were thinking of doing away with automatically putting the AFL into the Super Bowl every year. They were going to take every team that made the playoffs, AFL and NFL, and they were going to just mash them together. Um, and the idea was, hopefully from the NFL's perspective, that you would have an NFL team playing another NFL team in the Super Bowl game instead of an inferior AFL team and a superior NFL team. So that worked out really well in the end because Kansas City, of course, won the Super Bowl the years after the Jets did, and it really set the stage for the Super Bowl to be a major national event. Yeah, major national event. And again, going back to, like you said, the uh, Monday night, it's funny. Nowadays, every network would be chopping at the bit to get a chance to televise a primetime NFL game for the money and revenue that it brings in. Uh, speaking of money and revenue, I want to go back. You said that the three teams will get $3 million each. Like, Where did that the AFL ownership group put that up, or how did they get that money? That's a great question. I think the NFL put it up. Okay, so it was like an enticement factor bonus to go over there. In today's dollars, that's probably about 12 to $15 million. And for some of those teams back then, yeah, that would have been worth a lot more too. Yeah, it's it's pocket change. But back then, um, you know, adding $3 million to your bottom line was probably pretty good. And salaries were going up too because of the Super Bowl. The, the TV rights, NBC renewed the AFL, uh, CBS renewed the NFL, and then they had the extra money that was coming in from Monday Night Football. And the, the pot – Grew enormously uh, the year after uh, after Super Bowl two or uh, four because that's when the TV contracts ran out. And ever since then, the spiral of how much the TV people are willing to pay to get NFL football um, has been just growing and growing and growing. Yeah, but now you see the networks um, being a little bit less interested than they have been. And now you've got that's why you've got Yahoo and Amazon and such coming in and saying, well, we'll we'll televise, you know, a game of the week or that sort of thing, and we'll pay you some ungodly sum for that. So all of that goes back um to to the start of, of, of what happened after Super Bowl three. Yeah, that was maybe one of those uh I don't know what we call them, linchpin moments, whatever they're called when it like ch transforms. But another one going back even five years before then, well, actually, no, at about 10 years, I suppose it would have been. Yeah, so the 58 championship and the Weeb Eubank connection for the Colts and the Jets. And I didn't realize this until I got into learning about football history and everything. So how much of a factor did Weeb Eubanks mean to the entire story, we'll call it, of the Jets and the, the factor of this book? You can take it from the first day that he came to the Jets training camp and took over straight to the day of the Super Bowl itself. 
and you can see Weeb Eubank's impact. Now, a lot of it is not transparent, but Weeb had a philosophy. He didn't want to bring in the biggest, baddest guys to play for his team. He wanted, you know, really good size professional football players, but he emphasized that they had to be intelligent because he ran a somewhat complicated defensive system in particular, but also an offensive system that wasn't as intricate as the Kansas City Chiefs, who had the most, you know, dynamic offense of those of those years in the AFL. But he needed people who could really think. And and here's just an example: the Jets um, under Eubank didn't just have the quarterback come to the line of scrimmage and read the defense. The offensive linemen read the defense. The wide receivers read the defense, and the tight end read the defense run the defense. And the benefit of that is that Namath at quarterback could make more intricate um, play calls at the line of scrimmage uh, rather than something that would catch everybody off guard. But they were all basically reading from the same playbook. And so they would see what Namath sought for the most part and, and immediately be able to react. On defense, and I don't know how different this is from team to team, but the Jet defensive players told me that they not only had to learn their responsibilities on every play, they had to learn the responsibilities of the 10 guys around them and know exactly what they were going to do. Now, some of the benefits of that are pretty obvious. If you're playing against a guy, with a guy next to you who's a little weak at doing this, but particularly strong at doing that, that's helpful to you in understanding, okay, on this on this play, I've got to do this, but I've also got to keep my eye on what's going to happen with him because as much as he wants to be able or needs to be able to do something, he may not really have all the capabilities of doing that. So understanding everything that was going on around them made a huge difference. And it, te- it taught me a lot as I was writing the book about what's wrong and what's good about even NFL teams today. When you watch a game and see a lot of blown coverages in the secondary, chances are it's because the guys in the secondary, and that sometimes includes the linebackers, have not done enough watching of film and paying attention to what happens. Because we all know that these teams watch film the week before the next opponent's game, and in that film they see tendencies. But you can go a lot deeper than tendencies. You can see plays being, you know, good teams snuff out a play. And you wonder, wow, how did that guy know that on that play call that they were going to, they were, that this guy was going to go into that area and immediately, you know, be all over that play? And uh, I watched the Super Bowl game um, play by play probably about 12 times. And I noticed that Larry Grantham, who was the Jets' defensive captain and signal caller, on one particular play, um, seemed to know what was coming. And how did I see that? Well, he saw Unitas calling some plays, and I saw his legs moving, jumping up and down, and his hands going like this. And the minute the ball was snapped, he raced to the left sideline, where the Colts fullback was waiting for a swing pass. And Grantham got there at the same time that the ball did and tackled the guy for a loss. And I asked Larry about it, and he said, yeah, that's from watching film. And But, but now comes the part that I told you that Eubank's impact reached right into the game itself. When you watch film of a game, and I think that's essentially still true today, You only see the video. You don't hear the audio. I could be wrong. I'm not a, I've never been in a professional football uh, laboratory, so I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm pretty sure that they don't hear the play call. In those days, they certainly did not. It turns out that when Weeb Eubank left the Colts and Don Shula took over the Colts in 1963, Don Shula decided not to change the Baltimore Colts offensive system 
and defensive system. Weeb goes up to New York and he installs his offensive system and defensive system. So these identical systems are, are occurring on two different teams who don't play each other until 1969. And on the sidelines in the first quarter of Super Bowl III, Weeb noticed that as Earl Morrow, the Colts quarterback, was making play calls, he was barking out the exact same signals, the exact same calls that the Jets did in, you know, in their regular offense. And he called Joe Namath and John Schmidt over. John Schmidt was the Jets center and said, hey, watch. And, and we basically was able to call the next play as it was developing because of, of the play call that was being yelled out. And he said, Joe, they're running the same system we are. So at some point, I believe it was early in the second quarter of Super Bowl three, Namath stopped going into the huddle and calling plays. Namath went to the line of scrimmage. He, 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 uh, uh, he would call the plays from the line of scrimmage. And what he was doing actually was that he was yelling out signals that the Colts recognized too. And let's say there was a play that was designed to go to the right, or the Jets' right, um, a short pass or whatever, or to run to the right. Namath would call that play. And the minute the linebacker and safety on the Colts started to move in that direction, because they recognized the play too, Namath immediately stopped the play and went in the opposite direction within like a second and a half. And when you watch the game, you notice that the Colt defensive players always seem to be just a step or two behind the play. Invariably, almost every play. And that's because the Jets had gotten the defenders to go in the wrong direction. And you can be the greatest professional football player of all time. But if you start to go in one direction and the play goes in the other direction, you can imagine what kind of an adjustment that really is, especially when you're playing against very, you know, talented competition with great speed and acceleration. So, okay. So I was going to ask you a question later on and we'll just, we're going to go to that now. I I was going to ask you the question, if you play this game a hundred times over, will the outcome be the same or is it a fluke? But let's just take Weeb Eubank out of the equation. Just everything else. If you played this game a hundred times, you think it'd be the same outcome or was the Jets winning a fluke? You take Will you bank out of the equation. I think Baltimore wins the game, uh, maybe a hundred out of a hundred times. Which again, be one reason why they were such high underdog. Baltimore had an, an, an absolutely dominating defense that year. Um, they led the NFL in every defensive category. Ironically, the Jets statistically had a better defense than the Colts did, which I found amazing. Not in terms of points allowed. The Jets allowed more points. But in terms of um, um, yardage that they gave up and even yards, even plays where the Jets, you know, caused uh, a negative result, a loss of yardage on a play. But I-, I told you I didn't expect the Jets to win, and that's because for two weeks between the game and championship game in the AFL, NFL, and then the Super Bowl, the media just was saying that the Jets have no business being here. This is going to be a wrap. This will be worse than what Green Bay uh, did to Oakland and to Kansas City. And I talked to some of the Colt players for my book. Not a lot, but about a half a dozen of them. And to this day, they still are, um, it's not, not, not even a matter of not believing. They really underestimated the Jets' capability. And it really, the Jets felt insulted. They would watch TV in Miami uh, every night and watch the sports. And except for Namath, the Colt players couldn't even name any of the players on the Jets. It was as if, you know, who are these guys? Uh, And that really irked a number of the Jets players. So the Jets had a lot of things going for them psychologically. And Don Shula told Kurt Gowdy, the NBC play-by-play telecaster for the game, the week before the Super Bowl, that he was very concerned about the Colts because he thought that um, they were underestimating the Jets. Um, And he said any professional football team can beat any other professional football team. 
As a matter of fact, the defensive coordinator for the Colts was Chuck Knoll, who went on to great NFL fame with the Pittsburgh Steelers immediately after this game. He was hired by the Steelers. He had been on the coaching staff at San Diego, and he had seen Joe Namath for himself live on the field. And he told Shula, don't underestimate what this guy's capable of doing. And even Vince Lombardi, who didn't want to say anything good about the American Football League, told people that if there's any guy in the NFL, in the AFL that can make a difference um, and, and really take over a game, it's Joe Namath. So he recognized it as well. Yeah, I guess in my era, the Super Bowl that comes to mind is the Giants and Patriots that first time. As- He's the greatest upset in Super Bowl history. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I don't remember him. I guess I don't the the stories. I mean, I got to imagine it was the same thing where the Patriots were considered because that was when they were undefeated and everything. Like you know, the dominant they're going to win. And I remember that too. I, I fortunately my dad was in the hospital and I went down oh. to see him, but I remember watching the game in between you know visits into his room, and I had no expectation the Giants were going to win, although. The two teams had played the last regular season game for both, like three weeks before, and the Patriots only won like by like three or five points. It had been a much closer game than anybody thought, but still, people thought, well, Pittsburgh, New England's undefeated. How are the Giants going to beat this team that's undefeated? But they did, and that's why it's the second biggest upset in Super Bowl history. Because right. really, nobody, nobody thought the Jets were going to win. Yeah, I mean, didn't you said it was what a seventeen or twenty-seven point or something spread? Seventeen and a half and, and twenty point, you know, spreads. And um, uh, it was uh, I, I go into the book uh, about how those spreads were actually calculated, which it was quite interesting and quite insulting to the Jets. Uh, speaking of that book, let's remind the listener of the show again. So it's Beyond Broadway, Joe the Super Bowl team that changed football. And that's where we're going to transition just a little bit, Bob. We're going to ask you why when I flip the back of this cover over, it says Bob Letterer is a business reporter and the founder of RFL Communications. I don't see anything in here about being a team historian or anything like that. Why did you write this book and why the timing that you wrote the book? I wrote the book because um, – that team, and I, growing up in New York, I was a Mets fan, a Jets fan, a Knicks fan, and a Rangers fan. But the Jets team so um, captured, you know, me as as a teenage kid, um, and the fact that they won, um, and the day after they won, I went I went back to high school, and all my friends were Giants fans, and two. To a single one of every single one of them said to me, "Congratulations, your team deserved to win yesterday." I don't think I'd hear that today. I think I would have heard something that you would ask me before. You know, well, you know, if they played a hundred times, the Baltimore would have won ninety-nine of those games. But they all gave the Jets credit, and I was on a high, literally for a week, because it was so unbelievable, even to me, that we had won. And, and and the bigger part of it, this goes to it as well as far as impact. In those days, the NBA championship uh, was blacked out in the city where it was played. Well, the Knicks won the NBA title in May of 1970, about uh, 14, 15 months after the Jets won the Super Bowl. I was a big Knicks fan, and that game was blacked out. The Knicks, uh, the Rangers didn't win the Stanley Cup. They did go to the semifinals and got eliminated. I was a huge Met fan from the beginning of the franchise. But in those days, the World Series was played uh, on weekends, but also during the week in the afternoon. And so I didn't get to see every minute of all those games. I have since, obviously, because it's on video and you can watch it. Um, and in fact, the only time that I ever, ever, uh, cut class was the last half hour before the Je- before the Mets won the, in Game Five of the World Series. I had to take a subway and a bus to get to school every day, and I I, I cut the last class 
uh, and walked very, very gingerly to the subway station and waited until Cleon Jones caught the less out of the ninth inning, and then I went down into the subway. But I didn't get to, I didn't even get to see that. But the Super Bowl was played on Sunday. This game started at about three o'clock Eastern time, and I saw every minute of it. And all the pregame, and the pregames then were not four hours long, they were like an hour and a half long. And the postgame, of course, watching the Jets and Namath in the locker room was something to remember as well. And so I think that also helped create um, a feeling within me that I've held. There's a, there's a story in the book that is quite telling. Uh, in the middle of the second quarter of Super Bowl three, the Jets were on defense. And jo- uh, Verlin Biggs and Jerry Philbin, who were the right defensive end and the left defensive end of the Jets, both had Earl Morrill, the Colts quarterback, in their grasp, and, and he somehow eluded them. And I got up out of my chair and started yelling, get him, get him. Uh, my dad, sitting in the back of the same room, who was not a football fan, yelled out, Bobby, what is wrong with you? My uncle Charlie, who was a big sports fan, turned to my dad and said, leave him alone. He's experiencing something he's going to remember for the rest of his life. And truer words were never spoken. So I've talked with my family over the years that I wanted to do a book about that team, but I wasn't going to do another Joe Namath book. And about five, six years ago, I was watching Super Bowl three, and my two sons, both teenagers, came in, and they'd never seen it. And I said, hey, I want you to sit and watch this game. It's not artistically the greatest football game of all time. But the impact of this game was enormous. And they asked me so many questions about the other players on the Jets team that day that I turned to my wife and I said, I have the book. I know exactly what I'm going to write about. I'm going to write about everybody else on the team, not name name it. Now, that's a really cool story, how it came back. And like you said, it was something that you'll never forget. Something, the moment, I forgot the exact quote that you just said, but. I And, and I'm sure, you, you know, as big a sports fan as you are, um, you probably have experienced that too. I mean, I, you know, I know people, Detroit Tiger fans, who will never forget when they won the World Series. Um, and, uh, you know, when I've talked to other fans from around the country, same thing. I'm sure the Cincinnati Bengal fans today are going nuts. And if they win, and I hope they do, uh, that town is going to be up for grabs. Uh, <laughs> and it should be because, you know, you don't you don't get that opportunity that often. So speaking of the opportunity, and you, you found your book, you knew what it was. And it's, it's neat because it was brought up by your sons, essentially, through watching the game that you cherish and love from your childhood. We'll go back to the childhood then. We'll use the DeLorean, if you will. We'll go back. The interviews that you just had. So what? maybe take me to two or three, whatever, however many stories you want to share. Some of the interviews of some of the players that you grew up watching that you had for this book and some stories to share. Well, you know, most of them I, I knew only as names. A couple of them, you know, you would hear – You'd hear them on the radio or on the television. Mostly growing up in New York, you heard about Weeview Bank, Joe Namath, and Sonny Werblin, who was the principal owner. They had, as I said, other stars. You know, the, uh, the late Don Maynard, who just passed away a couple of uh, days ago. I knew he had a thick Texas as- accent, but I'd never really heard him talk. Matt Snell was their fullback. I'd heard him a couple of times. Jerry Philbin, uh, who I ma- mentioned earlier, was a tough-sounding, tough-playing, you know, a, a defensive player. Um, my, my task here really was twofold. Number one, I had to find them. Um, I didn't know where they lived, and I didn't have a phone number. Uh, and luckily, I had a gentleman working for me, a young guy, who knew how to get in and around the Internet and to find phone numbers and locations and such. So he helped me really... Uh, find out their locations. And in some cases, we couldn't get directly through to the player, so we'd go through his family. Uh, That happened with Philbin, for instance. I called Jerry Philbin's home phone number and cell phone several times, and I got his voicemail, and I heard his voice, and I knew it was him. But he would never return my call. 
And so we went to his son and told him about the book we were doing. And he said, call Jerry tomorrow. I'm going to tell my dad. He's got to talk to you. And when I got Philbin on the phone, I couldn't get him off the phone. He talked for two hours until he got a horse. And then he begged him, begged off and we did the rest of the interview later. But most of the interviews went something like this. Um, they would generally say to me, you know, I've been waiting for almost 48 years. It was, this was uh, 2016. I've been waiting like 48 years for anybody to ask me about the Super Bowl. Everybody asks Joe every year. You know, as I mentioned before, nobody asked, you know, uh, the first guy I talked to was the punter, who was quite a character. His name was Curly Johnson. And he was like the team's court jester, as well as a hell of a good punter. And he actually had CTE problems already. But his wife, who answered the phone, said, I've heard all the stories that Curly has told over the years. And I will, I'll tell them to you. And she did. And then she checked with Curly to make sure there wasn't any others that she forgot to pass on to me. And she said to me, you know, Curly's been waiting all this time because he had things that happened to him that year that he thinks are quite telling and need to get down in history. So that was one typical response. An atypical response is what I got from Philbin and from Emerson Boozer. And those were, ironically, my two favorite players on the team. Um, they both said to me, I've told them my story so many times before. There's nothing new under the sun. You can just go and buy books and read what I've told other people. And I said, no, I have things I want to ask you about that I know you haven't been asked about. And they said, like what? And I told them. I told Philbin that I know he had a huge personal relationship with one of the big radio sportscasters in New York at the time named Bill Mazur. And I said, I want to talk to you about that relationship. And he said, you remember Bill Mazur? I said, heck, I do. I remember listening to his show every day, and he always talked about how great Jerry Philbin was. And although I could only see you on TV for the home, for the road games that you played, I had great respect for what you could do. So he talked to me for that reason. Emerson Boozer, the hook with him was that he had gotten terribly injured, his knee and his ankle, in the year before the Super Bowl. He had was on his way to setting all kinds of touchdown records when he got hurt against Kansas City. And I talked to Em and said, I want to talk to you about your rehab because you had not only an incredibly serious dual injury, but people have wondered how in the world you ever recovered from it and came back and played football, especially in so short a time. And after he had said no to me, I, and I explained that to him, he said, okay, when do you want to talk? And so... I was able to really personalize, and I did this with every player I talked to, things that I remembered about them. And I'll tell you, I think one of the funnier stories. The safety on the team was Bill Baird. Bill Baird was about five foot eleven and he weighed about 175 pounds soaking wet. He was small for his position and he was very light for his position. I didn't realize how bright he was. He he basically made plays. Because like Grantham, he studied film like a demon, and he knew everything the other team was going to throw at him. So he was able to utilize whatever physical capacity he had in order to make plays. But he was so thoroughly um, uh, disregarded by most football fans that I said to Bill, I remember reading uh, Street and Smith's football preview and Sporting News's football preview. And every year it said, this has got to be the year the Jets finally get rid of Billy Bear because he's just not very good. And he just laughed. And that was my in with, with Bill Baird. Uh, and he and I have remained, you know, uh, close. We talk on the phone a couple of times a year and he's one of the really elder statesmen now of this team. He's, he's well into his eighties, but you know, a great guy and, and always willing to tell me all kinds of stuff about what happened with the team. So, I built relationships with a lot of these people. I built trust in them. I told them I was not there as a page six, you know, guy trying to get scandalous stuff. I wanted to find out what really had happened that year. Tell me the good and the bad and tell me the kind of stuff that, you know, uh, that's never been, you know, published before. 
And the thing I told about Namath and going to the line of scrimmage and making calls at the line of scrimmage never been published before. Uh, and, and in fact, I tried to talk to Joe about it. He didn't cooperate with the book. But John Schmidt, the center, told me that story and told me exactly what the Jets had done that day and how they had basically outsmarted the Colts. Um, so uh, it gives you a little bit of an idea about what some of those conversations were like. But they were they were lengthy. I taped every conversation, and I still have them, uh, and I treasure them. Uh, and I'm hoping even someday maybe it'll be made into a movie and I've got all that information I can still, you know, put into play. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. We'll get into that, but <laughs> that'll be a little bit off scene. So I'm going to kind of get go in here with the DeLorean question. This is your your official DeLorean question. So you're going to steal the keys, my DeLorean, right? You're going to go. Remember DeLorean. You're not old enough to remember the DeLorean. Yeah, so the DeLorean came out, uh, or I'm sorry, the Back to the Future movie came out the same year I was born, the first one. But yeah, the the, the trilogy definitely was one of my favorite trilogies of all time, and it's the premise. So if you look at the cover art for the podcast, you'll see it's me and a DeLorean. We're going back in time to learn about the history of the gridiron with the fans of the show. Uh, You're going to go back, and it's not the Super Bowl because that's been talked about at nauseum, but you're going to go to the season of the 68 jets and you can pick and you can relive yourself with the jets organization and the members one moment from that season. What would it be? Oh, it's, it's gotta be the Heidi game and the jets uh, famously losing a, a uh, two or a three point lead in the last one minute and 14 seconds and losing the game by 11 or 12 points. Um, because one of their safeties, Jim Hudson, had been thrown out of the game, uh, and the substitute, Mike D'Amato, had not been properly uh, trained as to what to do on a couple of specific things that the Raiders like to do. And um, he let the uh, uh, he let the running back get behind him, Charlie Smith. Charlie Smith burned them for like a 30 or a 40-yard touchdown. And then on the ensuing kickoff, and the Jets still had, oh, I don't know, a minute left. And, and Namath was getting ready to go back in the game, and he had one of the best games of his season that year. Uh, the Jets fumbled the ball and fumbled it into their own end zone, and Oakland recovered uh, and put the game away. Um, so a 32-29 Jets victory became uh, a 43-32 to 32 Jets loss. Uh, in, in a minute and 14 seconds. And the other the other thing that I remember that season is that Namath twice had games where he got intercepted five times. And it was the reason that the Jets lost those games. They only lost three games that year. One was the Heidi game, and the other two were to Buffalo, five interception game. Buffalo only won one game that year. That was the game that they won. And the second one was against Denver. Two weeks later, and Denver only won like three games that year. So uh, those games are memorable on a, on a very negative way. <laughs> but I can show you the parody that is a season-long type of – I mean, even going back to the Super Bowl teams right now, nobody would have ever thought that the Bengals – and at one point the Rams were just such a downward spiral too. I mean, granted, they always had the aspirations. But, yeah, same thing. I mean, a lot of teams do that. They kick it on at the end of the year or something, and then – like we go back to the Giants and the Patriots we talked about earlier. It's hard to be. It's almost impossible to be perfect every game. And, and you know, growing up as a kid, this is the other thing I remember really feeling inside. I didn't want the Jets to win games by three or six or seven points. I wanted them to dominate. And every week I'd be disappointed, except for a game here or there, because they didn't dominate, or the defense didn't do this, or the offense didn't do that. Um, And that's not being realistic because these are human beings and they have all the frailties that all of us do and getting them up to play at their full capability every single game uh, is just not realistic. Yeah. It's kind of like, like we said earlier, the, if you played a hundred times without how many games would each one win. And uh, that's what I like about the the NFL too. There's that parody. Um, Speaking of going back to your childhood and then the book and everything, before we leave, we got to give the listener of the show one last chance to learn what's the book's title and where can they find it? 
It's uh, Beyond Broadway, Joe, the Super Bowl team that changed football. Um, and you'll find it on Amazon. They've got good pricing on it on Amazon as well. And and if you have any doubts, read the reviews uh, on the page. Um, we have over 100 reviews from people. And uh, frankly, some of the written reviews, I I got back to some of the people who I didn't know, and I said, wow, you know, I can't thank you enough. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. The book is not only for Jet fans. It's not only for people who really love the American Football League. Uh, it's for people who are interested in the history of the NFL. And I learned a lot about the history of the NFL in doing this book as well, because uh, it, 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 you, you mentioned before Unitas and the 1958 overtime championship for the Colts. And that really was a starting point uh, for a lot of what happened with the American Football League. But you have to go even earlier than that back to the start of the NFL and look at where the franchises were and all the problems they had drawing fans. And I mean, great example. I read that in 1949, I believe it was, the New York Giants needed to draw 15,000 people a game to the polo grounds to break even. And they were having trouble doing that. So the 58 game really changed the whole outlook of America about professional football, the excitement that was generated by that one overtime game got everybody in the co- in the country really, you know, hyped up. And in fact, a number of prospective owners of NFL franchises started knocking on the doors of the NFL and saying, hey, what will it take for me to, to get a franchise? And the NFL was not in a mood to expand at that point. And that's why... Guys like uh, uh, Hunt and uh, uh, the, the owner of the of the Oilers, uh, name escapes me at the moment, but others, Baron Hilton, who bought the San Diego franchise back then, uh, why they decided to start a new football league. Because they wanted to get into the pro football business, and the NFL wouldn't let them. And as a matter of fact, as the AFL owners, who were very wealthy for the most part, got the league going, and we're ready to run the first year. That's when the NFL owners went to them and said, tell you what, we'll give you a couple of franchises if you drop everybody else. And it was too late. They'd already made, you know, deals uh, and, and had understandings with, you know, guys in eight different cities in the AFL. And then that's what they say. The rest is history, folks. But speaking of history before it were history, any last words of wisdom for the listener of the show regarding this topic? Yeah, I think um, the book has got a value for another reason, and that is it, it really taught me something. And that is you have to have patience. We view Banks' uh, early years with the Jets, and he started with nothing. He literally had nothing because the, the New York Titans, which was the franchise that Sonny Werblin and his syndicate bought in 1963, basically had almost no pro- professional football caliber players. They had never gone more than uh, 500, 7 and 7 in a very decrepit American football league. And when we built, opened camp in 63, he only noticed Larry Grantham, who became, the, who stayed as the defensive captain and was still on the Super Bowl team and a starter in 69, Don Maynard, who had been a star already with the Titans, but who we thought was just not very professional in the way he went around his business. Bill Mathis, who was a halfback, who we've had real doubts about because he didn't have great speed and he wasn't, you know, all that uh, good a a receiver. Um, He blocked okay. And we basically told him, you're going to have to improve your game from soup to nuts uh, in order to make this team. And Curly Johnson, the punter I mentioned before, um, who was already a good punter. He was one of the best punters in the league, but he was a wise guy. And we wasn't sure what to make of that. And Paul Rochester, a defensive tackle who came to the Jets in Weeb's first year um, and basically was very, very cerebral. And he he helped Weeb a lot with planning, uh, you know, for for upcoming games and such, because Weeb didn't know a lot of the teams and a lot of the players in this new league that he was coaching in. So um, what I learned is patience. Weeb was 5'8 and 1 in 1963. 
He was 5-8-1 and one in 64. He was 5-8-1 and one in 65. That was Namath's first year. And you would have thought, with records like that, that they weren't making progress, but they were. The league was getting better, and the Jets were getting better players. It's just that they weren't going fast enough with those players. Well, in 65, they got Namath. They got Verlin Biggs. They got, excuse me, George Sauer Jr. They got Jim Hudson, and they picked up a linebacker from uh, Buffalo, Al Atkinson, who became their starting middle linebacker. And all of a sudden, the players that were already there and these five new young additions started to make a difference. They started to have a winning record in 67, and in 68, they had the ultimate record that they had that got them into the Super Bowl. Patience. They were ready to dump Weeb the week, the year before the Super Bowl, and they reached out to uh, Vince Lombardi, and Lombardi wasn't interested in taking the Jets job. There you go. Patience. Now, how about that different perspective on Super Bowl three winning team, the New York Jets? I mean, there were some awesome stories on this episode, but I'll tell you, it's only the tip of the iceberg. Because as I'm opening up this book, we have almost 400 fully stocked, fully loaded pages of New York Jets 1968 football history. So make sure you pick up a copy of Bob's book. And again, that book is called Beyond Broadway Joe, the Super Bowl team that changed football. You can pick it up at most of your major retailers. And even if you want to go pick it up at Amazon, we got a link for you in the show notes. But again, huge thank you to Bob Letterer for riding Shotgun in the DeLorean to share some stories about the team, that's capital T-E-A-M team, that won Super Bowl three, helping us gain a little more insight into the history and the fabric that was the 1968 New York Jets. Now, for a chance to win a signed copy of this book, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And again, don't forget to either subscribe or follow the show on your podcast player choice. You'll be notified as soon as the next episode releases. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.